technical content uh, tonight. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go through you know relatively uh, quickly, um, but uh, I'll since uh, you know the the talk's gonna be recorded and the slides will be available. Uh, you can always and I'll, I'll I'll try to leave some some time at the end for questions. And then also, um, you know, feel free to contact me. You can find me on LinkedIn if you have other Wi-Fi questions or if you'd like to learn um, more about Wi-Fi. So, um, yeah, I, I've been working on Wi-Fi for, for um, it's nearly 24 years now. So, uh, you know, I've, I've been lucky to uh, uh, have experience with a, a lot of the, the work done in the IEEE and, and worked on products and, and uh, a number of different things. Uh, and so um, I'm going to, you know, try to walk through some of the uh, the things I've learned over the years, uh, starting with uh, an overview of Wi-Fi, uh, and then uh, some of the history, uh, both in the standards uh, that have been developed in the IEEE, the IEEE 802.11 working group, uh, and and task groups there, uh, and touch on a, a few things in the Wi-Fi Alliance. Um, and uh, uh, a lot of the, the topics will be very technical. So I'm gonna talk about um, enabling technologies, but I'll, I'll be talking at a high level. So hopefully, uh, you know, there'll be something for, for everyone here. Uh, and then I'll, I'll kind of wrap up with a, a state of the, the latest developments that are coming out in Wi-Fi 7 and, and their new Wi-Fi 7 products coming out right now. So it's a good topic. So I, I always kick off a discussion with Wi-Fi, you know, what is, what is Wi-Fi? Is it free internet access or is it wireless ethernet based on IEEE standards? And, um, the, you know, the kind of the funny thing is, is, is when I, I talk to people that are, are younger, like maybe college student age who've, who've used Wi-Fi their entire lives, um, you know, they, they, of, they just sort of assume Wi-Fi is just, you know, oh yeah, it's the free internet, you, you know. And um, whereas people who've worked in the industry for a long time, of course, know that, you know, it's, it's actually based on, uh, you know the uh, you know early early Ethernet, um, but um, replace the cable with a wireless uh, you know wireless channel. So um, and, and in fact the name Wi-Fi is actually a brand name. It's it's a it's, uh, um, that uh, is used for devices that have passed a certification test from the Wi-Fi Alliance. Wi-Fi Alliance is an industry group uh, that that uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about the Wi-Fi Alliance later, but. But it, it was created to um, uh, help promote interoperability and help market and, and uh, you know grow grow the the industry. Uh, Wi-Fi devices um, uh, employ the uh, IEEE 802.11 st standard, and um, this is a standard that is uh, um, always changing and developing. Uh, you, you may have heard of the 802.11 G N and these and so forth. These are these are amendments. Uh, that the IEEE uh, uh, adds uh, as they as they develop a, a new piece for the 802.11 standard, and then um, every every few years or so, uh, the 802.11 group does what's called a roll up, where they they generate uh, you know they they take the old amendments and they they merge the text with the with the base standard and they create a new base standard. So the the current 802.11 standard is 802.11 2020. Um, and uh, you know devices uh, uh, that follow Wi-Fi, of course, you know use radio, uh, and they transmit and receive primarily uh, internet protocol packets, uh, you know over over short ranges, usually indoors, but but some outdoors as well. So uh, the, the you know the typical uh, language in in, in um, consumer terms, when people buy a wireless router at at home, a wireless router. Uh, actually contains uh, uh, an act, what's the IEEE calls an access point. Uh, and an access point uh, has includes in it, you know, a wireless transmitter and receiver that incorporates a, a station. And, and client devices, you know, like a phone or something like that are often just called stations in and of themselves. But, but both sides are technically stations. Access points uh, have the ability to forward packets then onto uh, you know, a, what they call a distribution service, but it's normally the internet. Um, and so, so, you know, what, what does actually Wi-Fi en encompass in the networking world? Uh, if you, if you think about, I, you have a device like a phone or a laptop computer that has is running an app or a web browser, you know, that's gonna, uh, that's gonna communicate normally, you know, using, a, uh, you know, the internet. 
uh, through a protocol stack. And the protocol stack is usually part of the operating system in the computer. And at the bottom of that protocol stack, uh, at some point there'll be uh, a, a packet or a frame that, that has a, a data on it with a, a MAC address or a media access control address. And that's where you enter the world of, of Wi-Fi if you're, if you're using Wi-Fi. Everything under there is part of the Wi-Fi. And, 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 and the, the two layers that are defined in the 802.11 standard for this are the MAC layer which is basically who's, you know, whose turn is to transmit and, and you know, all the technical details involved in that. Uh, and then the physical layer, which is, you know, everything from you know, bytes to radio waves and, and then on the transmit side and then back to radio waves and bytes. So that, um, that packet that comes out of this protocol stack uh, that is then passed on to a Wi-Fi driver uh, that, that usually, you know, you know, may actually run on some separate hardware, may run on the you know, phone or the PC processor itself um, that, that handles a number of different features you know, related to security, connection management, buffering, and so forth. Uh, at some point then it is handed off to a chipset though uh, that uh, uh, is, is uh, you know, sold by a chipset vendor. And, and uh, that, that's the, what does the actual work of converting the uh, data bytes to you know, radio waves and, and so forth. Now it's it's always good to to uh, you know put put Wi-Fi in in perspective in terms of you know how is it how is it different from you know the other uh, you know large uh, you know wireless networking technology that that we use today, which is cellular systems. And so, um, you know, Wi-Fi of course uses unlicensed spectrum, just like was in the quiz there. Um, uh, there's uh, cellular systems. Uh, all, all use license bands, you know, that are actually owned, you know, owned by entities, you know, cell, you know cellular service providers. Um, Wi-Fi, um, because Wi-Fi is unlicensed spectrum, there's not just Wi-Fi devices in these these bands. There's microwave ovens. There's Bluetooth. There's, you know, radars. There's there's all you know there there are other things there. Um, there there's uncontrolled interference, and and that that is is mitigated both by primarily by the protocol designed and then also you know by the, the hardware itself. But the IEEE uh, 8211 protocol is designed to work in this type of uncontrolled you know interference environment. It works around interference and works around other devices. Um, whereas in a cellular environment, you know it's very different. The, because the spectrum is in, in a particular region is is owned by someone and, and controlled by them, they you know they're they have uh, you know they they Basically, design their system to control their interference, and their system design, and, and so forth. So the, the, um, the, you know, there's there's standard. It's obviously technical differences, there's standards differences, and there are there are fundamental sort of philosophical differences uh, on how things are done. And um, you know, Wi-Fi, uh, since Wi-Fi is always operated in unlicensed spectrum, uh, you know, it has to, uh, you know, it it's forced to, you know, look at look at the environment differently. Um, so the, the Mac layer, these Mac layer and fire layer carry packets over the unlicensed bands. The primarily, the primary mechanism for access in the channel, the, the kind of fundamental one, fundamental media access, uh, technique is something called carrier sense, multiple access with collision avoidance. Um, and that's where stations basically listen on the channel and they, they wait until the channel's free and they, uh, they, have a back off counter where they they wait a certain amount of time before accessing the channel, um, and then after they transmit, they look to receive an acknowledgement. Uh, there's no collision detection uh, in A211, um, at least as part of the standard. I mean, there's um, devices normally are either transmitting or receiving, so they don't have a way to know for certain whether a packet is is uh, uh, you know there's been a collision or not. Um, but since they have this acknowledgement. They can they can they'll test to see if a they they know their packet has gotten through, uh, and then they'll um, if it hasn't if they don't receive an acknowledgement, uh, normally the process is to retransmit that packet. I'll kind of spend a couple minutes here walking through the basic this basic concept again. So um, you know all the in, in within a you know an area uh, um, normally devices would be operating on the same channel. In this case. We have two two client stations that 
want to communicate, want to send packets to an access point. Um, the basic protocol would follow something like this. Station one transmits this packet to the access point. Uh, a short, what's called a short inner frame space later, that access point will then send an acknowledgement back uh, to the to the client device. The medium then becomes free. There's there's a a longer period of time uh, called an arbitration inner frame space. And, and when the medium has been, been clear for that long a time, uh, other stations know that, that they can now jump in and transmit. And so in this case, station two sends a packet to the access point. The access point sends an ACK back and then the process continues. Now, one thing you'll, you'll see about this is that it's there's actually quite a bit of time uh, that's not used for data transmission. There, there's an overhead in terms of these acknowledgement packets, in terms of this this time for this arbitration and back off and so forth. And that that is one of the problems with data eleven is that inherently a um, uh, uh, a system like this, this a CSMA CA system uh, does involve a certain level of overhead. So um, one thing that's kind of interesting about CSMA CA uh, in, in terms of understanding uh, the protocol uh, is that it's actually uh, um, can be thought of as, as an implicit token bus. And th th this is described in the Rasekis and Gallagher book. Um, but if you think about this uh, as when stations, if I have a set of stations here, I have like four stations that, that all want to transmit and they've all, they've all selected a uh, back off time. Um, you know, the, and and we'll assume in this case that the back off times are all different. Then, then the the back off times they choose will end up selecting an order uh, in which they're allowed to transmit, and they don't. And and there's no explicit token uh, that that has to be shared. You know, you know, to show like who gets to transmit and so forth. It's it's all uh, it's 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 implicit, um, but it's it's the same it's the same concept of of. Like sharing a bus, where where each each device has to wait uh, wait until it's you know they have the they have this implicit token in order to transmit, and and so that's that's actually a um, I think it's a helpful way to sort of intuitively understand what what's going on with the CSMA CA protocol. Now, one of the nice things about ADA two eleven um, is because it's an, an an open standard and there's a lot of free software and other things out there. Um, is that you can you can listen to uh, and the uh, um, eight or two eleven packets on the air um, re really for free actually um, with with a tool called um, I use a tool called Wireshark uh, which is a you know free software tool uh, and um, in this case I, I just have it it's running on a on a Linux um, uh, a Linux computer I, I keep in my office for this purpose and and um, uh, you know, this is a this is a common tool that's used for a lot of things and in, in used by um, in lots of types of networking. Um, but the the nice thing about it is is that it it has uh, it you know it, it can it can uh, pull apart the uh, eight or eleven packets that are sent over the air, identify what they are and so forth. This is uh, in this case here I have um, uh, my, my phone uh, is actually uh, sending a, a what's called a probe request frame. Uh, to the uh, an access point that I I have in my office, uh, and um, th this is the uh, and this is just showing the initial process that uh, the phone and the access point would go through um, as the uh, it associates and becomes part of the the network, and, and so um, and and this is uh, uh, and, and this this particular tool Wireshark um, can be used both for you know testing networks and then also uh, debugging and also just as a learning tool to understand. You know what's going on uh, in a wireless network. Now, um, the radio portion uh, of uh, wireless networks uh, in, in modern modern Wi-Fi eight hundred two eleven uh, networks are uh, normally uh, can be implemented in a in a single chip. Even even very uh, uh, sophisticated ones, such as are in uh, expensive wireless routers or access points. This is an example um, showing a, a radio design. Um, for uh, a radio that would be uh, capable of, of 8211AX operation. It was published in ISSCC in 2020. Um, this is, uh, in this case, it's a, it's a four by four dual band, what's called dual band, dual concurrent Wi-Fi uh, transceiver. And that means it actually has eight 
transceivers in it uh, and covering 2.4 and 5 gigahertz bands. You can, they're actually, they're outlined here. Um, and uh, these, since they're designed to operate concurrently or simultaneously, there are, there are um, baseband filters for each of those. And the way um, a chip like this um, would be mated with a, a separate chip uh, that does the digital signal processing uh, to do the, you know, the modulation, demodulation, and MAC functions. But, um, and, and uh, if you're, if you're interested in learning more about the, the types of radio designs, actually, ISSCC is, is helpful. They, they, uh, you know, people uh, over the years have, have published, uh, you know, different chips for Wi-Fi designs, and, and uh, there's a lot of material there. Uh, it's helpful. All right, now I'm going to jump into the history portion of the talk here and, and, and kind of go through uh, wireless Wi-Fi from the, the early days. Um, back before there even was uh, an 802.11 standard, there were um, there were wireless network cards you can buy. This is actually a this is actually a photo from an ad I pulled off eBay a few years back. Um, so I don't know if these are these are still available now, but this is a, this is a card from 1990 um, that was made by NCR, and it actually did it it did two megabits per second, um, you know, which is really really the same data rate. I'm not sure if it's exactly the same modulation, but probably pretty close to what the uh, original uh, 8211 uh, 1997 standard did. It used the CSMA CA protocol. Um, now the radio, of course, you know, wasn't, you know, had the, under this metal can here and half of a, an old uh, you know, IBM PC type card, um, you know, took a lot of, a lot of chips and, and stuff. So there's been a lot of, a lot of progress since then, but, but, uh, you know, some things, uh, you know, some parts of, you know, Wi-Fi, you know, had even been understood and, and done back in 1990. Um, now, in the the long road uh, from uh, you know designs like that until today, there were a number of different there were a number of key things that that helped enable Wi-Fi. And um, the the first, of course, was that um, first the FCC opened up um, the unlicensed radio bands uh, for communications. Originally, they they uh, um, they had regulations um, forcing or you know, basically, yeah, forcing the use of spread spectrum, which limited data rates. Um, they later actually uh, loosened those re regulations to allow uh, um, higher, basically higher modulation orders so you could get higher data rates. Uh, and then new new frequency bands were open. The UNI I bands, the five gigahertz bands were open. Now, um, the other thing that, that happened was, of course, is that the, the world switched largely from desktop computing um, in the 90s um, to uh, you know laptops and notebook computers, of course this is you know long before uh, even cell phones. Um, and um, you know the the, um, the the laptop the the you know top laptop manufacturers Apple, IBM, Dell in those days all um, promoted data to eleven, and, and so that that helped kind of push things along. Um, of course, Moore's law it, it had a huge influence through. Throughout the 2000s, um, uh, really up until you know, you know, recently, uh, as, as things have slowed down in, in terms of the, the scaling of, of transistor sizes, but um, more so, of course, is what enabled the the chipsets and the radios to become so so inexpensive and and to allow us to throw all the signal processing um, that's done on a, on a Wi-Fi device, and so we can get high high data rates at, at very low costs. And then, of course, the internet, um, which is what you know, drove uh, drove uh, um, a lot of the usage of Wi-Fi. So I always like to kick in a, a slide here on you know what 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 makes Wi-Fi so inexpensive. You know, a Wi-Fi um, Wi-Fi is designed into everything nowadays, and chipsets don't don't you know. Of course, prices aren't aren't, aren't usually public for chipsets, but they're they're not a lot of money, and and so um, you know, and they they are generally cheaper than than you know, other wireless technologies like a cellular chipset and so forth, um, and and part of this has to do with with just the you know the, um, the the short range issue. The fact that that if I'm transmitting over a short range and my my range doesn't doesn't vary very much, then my I don't have to transmit a lot of power, and my receive signal range the range of receive signal levels uh, is is not going to be nearly as large as it would be say. 
like in a cellular network where I have to be able to, uh, the system has to be able to handle ranges from, you know, say 30 or 40 meters up to, you know, a couple kilometers, you know, everything, all the ranges on, an, on a Wi-Fi system are generally, you know, between, you know, three meters to maybe 30 meters or so. So, so we don't have a, so that, that actually helps a lot. Um, and there are fewer frequency bands uh, in, in Wi-Fi that are, that are used in cellular devices. And that helps too. They, they don't, you don't need to, to have the same, um, you know, the, the radio designs are more complicated in cellular systems. Um, but then the, the, other, um, the other key thing is that because the spectrum is unlicensed and because the standards are open, there's a tremendous amount of competition uh, in the Wi-Fi business. Um, there, there are, and so what that means is that we can build you know, radios and, and modems and so forth that are, that are cheap, not, not cheap in terms of low quality. The, the designs are extremely sophisticated, but they are inexpensive to manufacture. Um, and so, uh, you, you know, the, the total end cost to the consumer is low. And of course, infrastructure costs are subsidized. And, and so, you know, you're, whereas in a, a cellular network, uh, you know, the, all that infrastructure has to come out of your phone bill. Um, in in Wi-Fi, uh, you know, other other organizations are are whether it's your your company or your university coffee shop and so forth are subsidizing it. So, um, all right. So now I'll I'll jump into a little bit of the the naming history in Wi-Fi. Um, you know, traditionally we used to always say eight to eleven B G and N and A C and you've heard of all of those. Those are as I mentioned, those are the amendments to the Wi-Fi to the eight to eleven standard. Um, Wi-Fi Alliance, the industry group um, promotes Wi-Fi, uh, created the name Wi-Fi 6 when, when the 802.11ax standard, when the first devices for the 802.11ax uh, amendment were, were being released. And, and in the process, they, they then you know, kind of went in reverse and, and created Wi-Fi 5, which was, used to be 802.11ac, Wi-Fi 4, 802.11n, and so forth. And, I, if you if you look around, I you know uh, there there uh, number you can number things back to one through three and so forth, um, but um, I'll I'll kind of use both here and kind of try them together. So, but in, in general, so the the Wi-Fi names um, are actually in some ways a little more precise in terms of what what the devices do because they the IEEE standards oftentimes contain many features that that don't end up in products and, and so forth. Um, whereas the Wi-Fi Alliance um, and, and market forces then actually determine what the features are. So, you know, Wi-Fi 6 actually incorporates things that are outside of 802.11ax and so forth, but um, the, the, the naming is close enough, so. Okay, so back to Wi-Fi 1, which, which is the, you know, the, the earliest kind of widely used standard or 802.11b. Um, this was, um, you know, the 8211 standard itself started in 1990, but the, uh, you know, most most products really didn't start uh, being released in a big way until um, around 1999. And at that time, uh, a group of uh, pioneers in the industry got together uh, to certify interoperability of 8211, devices following 8211B. Uh, and that's where this, you know, this WECA group was was formed and and they actually created the name Wi-Fi and this organization later changed its name to the Wi-Fi Alliance. Um, now back in the 8211B days or Wi-Fi One days, uh, you know the original products, of course, used multi-chip radio designs. Um, later, the uh, industry uh, shifted to uh, single-chip radio designs uh, as it as it that became feasible to implement. Um, this is an early one, uh, another ISSCC paper um, uh, that uh, shows a, a radio that can be used for both Bluetooth and for 8211B. And so and this particular chip um, has the, uh, the radio components you can, you can see because they have the nice structures, the inductors and so forth. Um, this, this particular chip could actually you know, modulate and demodulate Bluetooth on chip and then use the second chip to do the baseband uh, processing for 802.11b. Um, as, as time progressed, of course, there, there was a significant uh, technology development in Wi-Fi and 
I'll, I'll do a kind of quick walkthrough here and and then explain in, in greater detail what, what what each of these um, you know big features are. So uh, roughly the same time as 80 to 11 um, B was the 80 to 11 A standard was developed, which is the first five gigahertz standard. Products in that band took a few years um, to take off, but um, they uh, those and the 8811G products were the first Wi-Fi products that used OFDM modulation. And OFDM modulation is more bandwidth efficient and allows a much higher data rates uh, than the earlier modulation spread spectrum techniques that were used previous to that. Um, now, sort of in between the, the, these standards and 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 Wi-Fi 4 or 8211N, which brought MIMO, um, there was a very important standard called uh, 8211I or amendment called 8211I. And what that did is that actually introduced the, the modern security, that is security techniques, encryption techniques that are used in Wi-Fi. Before this, there, there was a very, uh, very crude um, uh, encryption used in, in uh, for Wi-Fi devices uh, that had actually been broken. And, and and you could download tools off the internet to crack networks. And it was actually a pretty scary thing um, for Wi-Fi. It, it, it actually could have, uh, if Wi-Fi hadn't figured out a way to make, make things secure, um, you know, as a technology, it may not have survived because, because um, you know, the, the whole issue of security in networks is very important. Of course, it will always be important, but um, so that was a very important development. Uh, and then, of course, the, the standards that made made Wi-Fi much faster, 11N, uh, brought multiple antenna technology and Mac, Mac layer aggregation. Uh, and then uh, 811AC actually refined a number of things that, that had already been introduced in 811N, um, primarily the beamforming, um, and then also introduced multi-user communication. And then Wi-Fi 6 uh, improved the multi-user communication even more with a technique called OFDMA. So um, now I'll, I'll walk through kind of some of the problems that that Wi-Fi has solved in in different uh, in different manners over the years. Um, Wi-Fi devices, of course, operating indoors, uh, they'll normally be a say a, a direct signal path from, in this case, an, an access point to a client device, but they'll always be reflections through um, off uh, you know things in the neighborhood of the device, uh, you know, our, our radios, practical radios don't operate in free space. And that, um, these reflections, uh, we call multipath. Multipath has the effect of creating nulls in the spectrum. You, you can you can see that, you know, just intuitively by the fact that a signal that is sent over one path, uh, if the other path, that signal is, is 180 degrees out of phase, you know, at some frequency it will be out of phase and other frequencies will be in phase. And so you'll, you'll get a sequence of nulls in the frequency pan. And so uh, techniques are needed to mitigate this. The, the, the technique uh, that is uh, used, has been used since 8211A, um, but is, um, uh, and then um, carried forward to uh, all, all the future standards since then is, is OFDM. And, and I, I'm, Probably most of you have, have at least heard of OFDM before, but the the idea is that we use a, a Fourier transform to um, to break up uh, the uh, channel into uh, subcarriers, and then we can modulate we can modulate these subcarriers separately. Um, and so, um, and this this uh, uh, helps with the um, fading channel problem by allowing us to uh, um, separate out uh, good channels and bad channels, and then we apply a, an error correcting code across those. And that's that's the technique called bit interleaved coded modulation. So the the two of these actually work together in the sense that what what is done in uh, a Wi-Fi device is, of course, an, an error correcting code is used uh, to encode the data, but then that that error correcting code uh, is then the the bits, the coded bits that come out of here are interleaved across uh, multiple uh, subchannels or multiple bins, uh, so that we don't 
uh, so that the error correcting code, the code doesn't essentially see a, a long sequence of bad bins. What, what we want to do is we want to get, we want to mix up some of the good bins and the, the bad frequency bins uh, with our error correcting code. And we do that through interleaving and um, an interleaver on the transmitter. This process is then reversed on the receiver and, and then uh, it can be decoded. Now, each each individual subcarrier is uh, modulated separately, but is modulated with uh, a constellation that's the same size. And I have an example here um, that, for example, if we use 16 QAM, this is taken from the 8211 standard, um, 16 QAM uh, is a quadrature amplitude modulation. It means I'm, I'm you know, selecting one of 16 possible constellation points are sent on that frequency bin, which corresponds to four different bits. And these bits are uh, are gray coded. That, that is, they're, they're coded in a manner so that the nearest neighbors, you'll see if I go from one neighbor to another neighbor, only one bit changes. And I've actually, each one of these individual bits is also interleaved with my bit, my uh, bit interleaving. So I'm doing, I'm in in 8211, I'm actually doing multiple, this interleaver is doing multiple levels. I'm, I'm interleaving both across these frequency bins and within frequency bins. I'm also interleaving. Um, and so it's sort of intuitive that, that that would, that, that this, you know, bit interleaving would be a good idea. You say, you know, I, uh, I have a chance of making a small bit error here, but if I have a good constellation, you know, I, I, I know I'll definitely receive those bits correctly. My error correcting code will be able to, uh, you know, um, compensate for those, you know, the the distances or the the, the missed distance there. But you know, there there's actually is um, there. Uh, you know, this has been studied. Uh, I have an example here. Uh, this is a a paper by uh, Care and, and Biglieri, and and uh, that actually um, uh, you know demonstrated the the benefits of of bit interleaf coded modulation. What they've done, and, and there are other references, I provided other references here uh, um, in, in a number of, of re more recent textbooks uh, that describe this. Um, but the idea is that I can, I can, I can use, a, say, a, a single, single constellation type, like, say, in, in the example I had before, 16 QAM, but, you know, we, we use larger constellations as well. And if I, by uh, employing this bit interleave encoding modulation, I can get great performance on um, on fading channels. Now, if if my channel is flat, if it's like an AWGN channel, so in other words, I'll just jump back here. If if my channel here was like flat, if if I, you know, the, I didn't have this fading going on, well, you know, bit interleaving leaving coding modulation wouldn't wouldn't necessarily be the best thing to do. But because the channel varies, and pretty much all ra all these indoor radio channels vary, um, I, I want to. Uh, this this technique turns out to be um, a good thing to do. So so that's what we do. And the codes um, uh, that are used in in Wi-Fi devices uh, are are both binary convolutional codes. This is an old code. Um, it originally dates back to the uh, 8211A uh, amendment as well. Um, and then in 8211N, uh, LDPC uh, codes were introduced. This is an example of, of one of the one of the code matrices uh, specified in the standard. Um, they use a, a block length of, of 1944 bits. There's actually three different sizes and four different rates. So there are actually 12 different possible, 12 different LDPC codes defined in the standard. Um, and they define them in the standard with matrices like, like these. Um, the dashes here are zero. So of course, it's, a, it's an LDPC code, so most of the most of the entries in the parity check matrix are going to be zeros. The numbers indicate actually a, a, a shift a shift on a on a diagonal matrix of ones. So, um, so most um, you know the the binary convolutional code is is older, um, but the LDPC code is now used in almost all modern Wi-Fi devices, and, and that gives a performance gain over the original uh, binary convolutional code. Now, 8211N, of course, is, is well known for, for being the first uh, uh, amendment to introduce um, MIMO. Um, MIMO, of, of course, is a, a multiple antenna technique. The idea is that you know, if I, 
I, I have a transmitter with multiple antennas where I'm transmitting simultaneously out of those antennas. And I have a receiver with multiple antennas that can receive over those antennas. Um, that instead of having a single channel with a single frequency response, like I, I showed earlier, I can have, uh, I'll have a matrix of, of channels. Uh, and um, the, the great thing about MIMO uh, is that, um, is that this, this matrix of channels, if you think about, the, I, I now, if I have a sort of a two by two system here, and it gives me a two by two matrix, and I've got these here, each one of these matrix elements will look like this. We'll have a you know, frequency response like this, and in most environments, it turns out that those these frequency responses will be different. And because of that fact, uh, it's possible for the receiver to diagonalize this matrix is essentially what it's doing. And I can get multiple paths over there. I can get essentially get multiple independent paths over the air, and I can increase my data rate correspondingly. So that's that's the idea. And what's um, and so. Um, What's even cooler about this in, in terms of what we do in Wi-Fi is that the same modulation technique, the same idea where I, I used OFDM and I did the, my bit interleaving, I'll actually do the same thing here where I'm, I'm actually interleaving now, not only across frequency, but then across uh, across uh, antennas as well. And that's that's what's, that's one of the techniques that's used in MIMO. Um, these channel matrices, of course, they they depend both on multiple um, antennas in the environment uh, and uh, upon uh, multiple paths. Uh, in uh, in other words, reflections in the environment. So, and and um, for Wi-Fi, we were very lucky uh, in the sense that the the uh, antenna environment uh, or the the environment, the wireless environment that we have normally has lots of reflections in it. And so um, spatial multiplexing or this idea that this, this matrix can be diagonalized uh, is something that occurs normally. And, and so, um, uh, and Wi-Fi devices uh, pretty much universally take advantage of this now. Um, cell phones uh, typically have two Wi-Fi antennas in them. A notebook PC can have more. Uh, and then a Wi-Fi uh, access points, of course, oftentimes now <clears throat> have four or more antennas. Uh, and that actually turns out to provide some ad advantage for uh, communicating with multiple clients. Now, another feature of, of 8211 um, that's been done over the years is, is that um, there's a general uh, sense of backwards compatibility. In other words, with each new Revision. We go from Wi-Fi three to Wi-Fi four, Wi-Fi five, and so forth. The the newer devices are always capable of uh, receiving and transmitting the the older protocols or the legacy protocols. And part of the way this is is accomplished is um, through the design of the Wi-Fi packet itself. And this is an example of a Wi-Fi six uh, particular packet format uh, taken from the. 8211AX standard. And this packet uh, includes um, signaling. Uh, in this case, the this is the, they call the L legacy short training field, legacy long training field, so forth. It includes legacy signaling that dates back to, you know, or their early days of Wi-Fi uh, 8211A or 8211G and so forth. So the normal packet um, will include both uh, these legacy signaling uh, and then new signaling that that you know follows the newer the, the newer standard uh, that is then used to decode the data portion of the packet, and uh, um, a a nice way to kind of get a, a sense of how this works is to actually pull some packets off the air, and and that's what I've I've done here. This is um, a this is an example of uh, my phone transmitting to an access point in my lab, similar to like what I had earlier with the, um, uh, <clears throat> sorry, the Wireshark trace. Um, and so it's it, there's a sequence of packets the, here, but I'm gonna focus in on the, the data packet here uh, that uh, um, is sent uh, from the phone. Uh, and this was, this was one that was used for two by two MIMO. And so I, I've captured it with a 
a two antenna system uh, in the lab. Now, if I look at the this, I'm, I'm going to just kind of blow up this data packet here. Uh, this is this is you know power versus time, so you can you see the, the different packets in time. If I just look at this in the frequency domain over the channel, this is a this covers an an 80 megahertz channel here, and uh, you know this is captured off the air with all the reflections in the office and and so forth, uh, and you can see there's a whole lot of fading in this channel here. Um, this this slide, I apologize, is a bit of an eye chart, but um, this this shows the captured. Uh, this is this captured 802.11ax packet. Uh, you can see the the structure. Uh, it's actually it's this is very nice. I, I felt because like you can see the structure of the different portions of the packet here, and um, uh, this is a, a MATLAB tool here that pulls these out. Um, and the nice thing about this tool is it pulls out the the signaling information that's conveyed in this part of the what they call the preamble of the packet. And this signaling information contains all the information about all the type of the packet it is. In this case, it's an 80 megahertz packet. It uses LDPC coding. It's a two. It's a two-stream MIMO packet. It's it's uh, um, you know some other uh, you know information here. Um, and when we finally get to the data part, um, the data has been modulated with the same 16 QAM modulation that I talked about earlier. Of course, there's noise and some you know residual you know, inter similar interference or something on there. That, so my constellation points are, you know, are um, are, are spread out uh, a little bit. But uh, you know, the the coding is sufficient to decode this packet, uh, and uh, I have the results here, and it includes the the MAC addresses. So this is the MAC address of the the phone transmitting to the MAC address of the access point, and that, all that all that data can be, you know, pulled out with a piece of test equipment. Now, you'll one thing you can see immediately, uh, you know, the system like this, of course, is that, wow, you know, I, you know, there's all this time spent on the air, only, you know, I, there's there's one data packet here, and lo and behold, yeah, the data part is here. There's all this overhead, and this is one of the this is one of the, the problems, of course, of data two eleven, and um, so, uh, you know, the the throughput or the the data, you know, the the useful amount of data that we send, of course, is is always going to be a function of the you know the data rate, the rate at which I transmit, and then the fraction of time, of course, that I'm actually sending useful data, and and uh, you know there's a lot of overhead in 8211, so um, uh, we we need to you need to make this data time longer uh, in order to get efficiency, and and that was something that. Of course, had been understood early on in 802.11, and and um, had been uh, the initial improvements started with 802.11n, MiFi 4, where um, basically packet you know, packets were aggregated together. Multiple you know, IP uh, IP packets could be loaded into um, the data portion of a particular Wi-Fi frame, and and so uh, suddenly you know uh, my my throughput, you know, was was increased dramatically with a relatively, uh, you know, straightforward, uh, you know, change to uh, the implementation. the The next next big feature, and in, in um, after that, was to uh, have multi user transmission. And this was introduced first in in Wi Fi five or or eight to eleven AC, the technique called multi user MIMO. Multi user MIMO. The idea is it's the same idea. I, I'm doing MIMO. I'm transmitting with multiple antennas, but I'm actually uh, spatially dividing uh, the channel so that I can transmit simultaneously to multiple devices. And so um, this actually uh, this actually uh, does not improve the over the overall data rate so much. I, in other words, I I could when I'm I'm doing this technique, I'm sort of splitting streams among these different devices. I I could send them all to one device at a time and then send it all to another device, but it it does improve uh, latency. It improves the, the 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 time delay it takes for data to get you know from the access point to the client, and um, so then then and this was improved again in uh, Wi-Fi six uh, using OFDMA, and OFDMA is same OFDM. It's an orthogonal frequency division 
but I'm making multiple access. So in other words, I'm I'm going to take my frequency band, in this case, a, showing a 20 megahertz channel from the standard, uh, and I'm going to break it up uh, into multiple subbands. And there's there's different ways to do that in the standard. I can send everything to one device, or I can break it up in multiple devices and so forth. And so starting in Wi-Fi 6, um, this could actually be done in both directions. An access point can transmit simultaneously to multiple clients. I can then signal uh, the the client um, uh, to actually to simultaneously transmit back. So, um, uh, so that that technique was was introduced in Wi-Fi Wi-Fi six. Now, the um, one one of the questions periodically is like, well. How much does that does that really help? Does does you know does this Wi-Fi six does this really work um, and so forth? And uh, yes, it it does. Um, it 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 works best when you have a latency constraint uh, and you have a a number of users uh, that are that are trying to use the channel simultaneously. Uh, I have an example here. This is from a paper, um, uh, a Globecom paper from last year. Uh, that did some experimental work with 802.11ax. Now, this improvement with OFDMA and Wi-Fi 6, we see it most on the uplink. Uh, and so this uplink result uh, here, um, they have they've set a, they have a particular system. They said, look, I, I need a, I have this constraint of, of 10 milliseconds of latency. That's my latency limit. Uh, if it's a robot system they talk about in this paper. And they show, you know, this is uh, this one is a Wi-Fi five case here that uh, you know can hit latencies 99th percentile, but this is so like one percent of the time. They can hit a latency of about 95 milliseconds. Going to Wi-Fi six, you know, roughly the same physical layer rate, but you you can cut the latency down below uh, 10 uh, 10 milliseconds in this case. So so there's definitely a benefit for off DMA, but it does depend on the right environment. Now I going kind of quickly through things, but I, as I said, I got a, a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of work in 20 years of Wi-Fi, so a lot of things um, worth covering. I wanted to spend one a little bit of time talking about security. In and uh, as I mentioned, the 802.11i before, um, you know, is is the standard that made um, you know Wi-Fi devices secure. Um, the original Wi-Fi um, uh, web uh, wire equivalent privacy. Uh, it turned out that the the design of that had had some flaws in it, and um, you know security wasn't you know in in the early days of Wi-Fi, you know two thousand you know in the nineties or so, you know security wasn't wasn't as as well understood. I, I would say universally as it is today, and so um, you know the the folks then made I think they they you know they they designed a system, but it just turned out that that computing. Uh, computing resources grew very quickly, and in breaking these early uh, systems uh, turned out to be feasible. Um, 802.11i made Wi-Fi secure, primarily by um, by providing uh, new uh, new encryption and new ways of handling encryption keys. And, and the key, one of the key ones uh, that you'll you'll see talked about a lot of times with Wi-Fi is a four-way handshake. This is the where the the four-way handshake is is um, described in, in 802.11. And the idea behind the four-way handshake is that if I have a secret, you know, like I know the password for my network and, and the access point, of course, knows the password as well, they don't share that password over the air. They instead um, share a, a pair of random numbers uh, that they then use uh, along with the, the, the password as, as a key uh, uh, to encrypt. And then they compare these encrypted random numbers and um, they use that to verify uh, that that they they have actually the same the same uh, key or same uh, pre-shared key. Now it turns out that this process itself, which has you know been used um, and was um, you know was tested by the Wi-Fi Alliance, where they have a protocol they call WPM WPA2. This itself has is is actually not not as secure as it could be because um, there are ways that uh, a uh, a sniffer can listen over the air and listen for this exchange of random numbers uh, and then either make guesses or if it, it has some understanding of what the password could be, uh, it then uh, it could determine 
uh, it could then uh, figure out the encryption key and then decrypt the traffic. Um, this has been improved recently. You'll, you'll see devices use WPA3. This, this uh, uh, solves that problem by using a new algorithm uh, that, that actually uh, computes an initial key, initial pairwise master key, uh, using a different method first. It doesn't actually just share these random numbers. It, it still does this process, four-way handshake, sharing the random numbers, but it does a, a, a different process first to generate a, a different pairwise master key and so uh, it's far more secure and, and very hard to crack uh, nowadays. Um, all right, so I spent about 45 minutes kind of going through the you know, kind of history of Wi-Fi and uh, you know, relatively quickly. And, and now I'm gonna talk about um, uh, some of the, the, the new things in 802.11be or Wi-Fi 7. So um, now in the, you know, Wi-Fi one through one five five. Um, every standard, you know, the key feature was it was faster. You know, we had high throughput, then we had very high throughput, and and so forth. Um, uh, Wi-Fi six, H eleven AX took a break and, and looked at efficiency, reducing latency. Um, but for BE, faster came back. Faster it was back. So we and they came up with extremely high throughput as a name for the IEEE amendment. Wi-Fi. It's called Wi-Fi seven. Um, the standard is still in draft. The this amendment, rather, is is still in draft form, um, but but products are starting to be introduced on the market. I believe the Google Pixel Eight is advertising uh, Wi-Fi Seven, um, and uh, expect to see more Wi-Fi Seven products pretty soon. Now, one of the nice thing about you know the IEEE standards, open standards, you can you can read, you know, you can read the standard and kind of see you know how much faster really. Can Wi-Fi 7 be over Wi-Fi 6? So I just took two pages out of the two standards here. This is Wi-Fi 6 on the left, or H11AX, and uh, a draft. This is from the draft of uh, you know 802.11be, um, and you know compared and went down here. A different there's you see different you know modulation types you talked about earlier, and you can you can go down and say okay, well um, H11AX can do about 1.2 gigabits per second. Using 1024 qualm, uh, you know, Wi-Fi 7, h 11 pe uh, is about 20% faster because you know it, it can do 4096 qualm, um, but it can also it can also actually double the bandwidth. It can operate a 320 megahertz bandwidth, uh, and so it it gets a gain a data rate of a you know a factor of 2.4. Um, so uh, uh, so there's so you know, for speed, the big things, of course, are 4096 gram and these wider channels. Now, these wider channels are, are really only feasible <clears throat> in the, there's a new six gigahertz band uh, that's being opened up by the FCC in the US and, and by regulatory authorities in other countries. Um, and so, but those are the main, those are the features that'll get you the raw speed increase. Uh, and then there are other features though, to improve, that improve efficiency and, and other issues that, that have been you know that it has been in 8211 for a long time, but but started to become more, um, uh, you know, more uh, important recently. And those are um, uh, multiple links, and uh, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, target wake times, which help organize the so organize frequency. Uh, sorry, <clears throat> excuse me. Organize access to the medium. Multiple links uh, are uh, have actually been. Uh, a part of Wi-Fi devices, you know, for a while, but not, you know, there there, there hasn't been um, uh, an uh, sort of a standardized way to do that. Access points, uh, you know, have been advertising dual band, dual concurrent, or an ability to handle multiple links for quite a while. Wi-Fi seven introduces a way for client devices or or state, you know, stations to also um, uh, operate with multiple links and multiple link. Um, there's there's a number of different ways to to set up multiple links that are being described in the BE standard, but um, the the simplest way or the, the simplest one I, I think to to understand is is that I have in this case a client device that has you know a rate you know has three different radio bands it can operate in, and I have an access point that also has three different bands it can operate in. Now the access point normally, you know, because it's an access point, it's plugged into the wall. It can keep those radios on. All the time, and 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 we'll do that, and we'll, you know, accept connections on them all the time. 
the the client device, well, it, it, it possibly could have these on at the same time, but more likely what, what's going to happen is the client device is going to associate with this access point. It's going to connect to the network. Um, and it's going to, um, and after it, after it connects on, on say one band, let's say on this 2.4 band, it becomes aware of this network. It's going to know that these other, you know, radios are there and it's going to, it's going to have connections that are actually set up, even though it's not actively transmitting on those. And then what it will be able to do is, uh, even though it's, uh, you know, it's communicating one band, it can, it can then send packets either simultaneously or, or, um, uh, or, uh, or not, or, or at a later time, uh, onto, uh, on another channel frequency band. And the, the way this used to be done uh, in Wi-Fi devices was, was through a handoff process where it actually have to go through a, you know, a frame exchange on one band and then a, another frame exchange on the other band. The multiple link operation uh, simplifies that uh, and um, uh, allows a you know, very quick way to, to you know, send packets you know, on these different frequency bands uh, and has a, should be able to uh, uh, improve efficiency that way. Uh, the second, uh, the second big feature in in Wi-Fi seven that's new is something called a restricted target wake time. Target wake times have been where are we're in Wi-Fi six, maybe not used as much as they could have been, but it's a very good idea. Uh, the idea here, uh, and this is a page. This page is actually taken from eight eleven AX standard, but it's that the access point can set aside times when only certain client devices or certain uh, clients will are you know can communicate with the access point so we have this and and the the idea behind this is that devices that are not part of this target wake time can actually go to sleep they can they can power down their their radio so what what wi-fi 7 does is it has these target wake times it, it sets up a time uh when certain stations uh are active and and other stations are, are not going to be active and this improves efficiency um, in the CSMA CA protocol. There's the you have fewer stations that need that will be contending for the medium. The medium access is more efficient, and so forth. And the devices that aren't active can actually power down and save power. Um, so this is an improvement in Wi-Fi seven, uh, and we can expect to see yeah you know that in, in devices um, uh, in the future. Now the big you know the big um, Benefit, one of the big benefits of of uh, using the you know recent Wi-Fi devices is is this opening of the the six gigahertz spectrum uh, that has been happening. Um, six gigahertz bands um, are regulated a little differently uh, than the than the traditional two point four and five gigahertz bands. Uh, these bands are are pretty much available everywhere uh, worldwide. Worldwide. Um, Whereas six gigahertz may or may not be used by other, maybe have license holders that are used in different uh, different um, parts of the world, or and or even within the U.S. in different regions. So uh, there's a there's been a mechanism for um, there's actually been two mechanisms for six gigahertz, uh, at least in the U.S. Um, one is is to uh, access points need to you know, query a, a database to determine if a particular six gigahertz channel is available in their region. And, and then that allows that. Uh, or um, alternatively in the low power indoor environment, um, devices can use six gigahertz as long as they're indoors and they're below a certain power level. Um, the nice thing about six gigahertz is, is that there's just a tremendous amount of spectrum here. So there's, you know, another 1.2 gigahertz is available. And so, um, as Wi-Fi channels have grown wider, um, there's, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's certainly, uh, it makes sense uh, to use, you know, there, there's a big advantage to having a wider spectrum, being able to use that. Um, okay, I have, a, I'm just gonna spend a couple minutes um, to wrap up here talking about other uh, 8211 technologies that you, that are, you know, not part of the Wi-Fi one through, uh, you know, seven family, but um, are still uh, available and, and there's been development on. Um, one of them is H11AH called Wi-Fi uh, Halo. This is a a nine uh, 900 megahertz band. Uh, allows longer range 
uh, lower data rates and, and so forth. Um, this has been, uh, this activity hasn't taken off as much uh, in the, the Wi-Fi world. Um, uh, I, I don't, I, I haven't worked myself in this area, but you know, I, I believe part of the reason why it, it may have had trouble is because there's, there's been competition from you know other other standards and other things. The 900 megahertz band, um, but it's but uh, this is something an area that's likely to grow in the future. Um, uh, 811 also has millimeter wave technology. Uh, 811 AD, 811 AY. Um, this has uh, 811 AD has been around for actually quite a while since I think it was standardized as maybe 2012. Um, but the the market for this has mostly been um, in uh, fiber, uh, in, in markets where it's, it's too expensive to install fiber. So like on campuses and campus networks and so forth, uh, backhaul uh, type technology use 802.11, but they're standardized than the 802.11 standards body. Uh, and then uh, future technology. So the 802.11 standards body, of course, is always looking at new technology uh, and um, uh, that includes, uh, uh, and you know, these are a number of product, uh, projects that have been going on, uh, a vehicular standard, actually BD finished end of, uh, early early this year uh, and uh, is a new vehicular standard. Uh, there's gonna be, a, there's an amendment for um, wireless land sensing. Th these are features uh, that can be added to the 811 protocol to allow uh, sensing in the environment, like locating devices, not in a location, but, but yeah, in a more of an indirect way. Um, uh, there's also um, uh, an amendment looking at randomizing MAC addresses. Th this is something that's done for um, uh, uh, for anonymity purposes. There is it's common. Uh, there's non-standard ways of doing this. They're they're going to standardize that. Uh, also, there's uh, enhancing data privacy improvements to security overall, looking at NBI. And then um, the next, the, the follow on to Wi Fi 7, Wi Fi 8 is actually the development is starting next week. So this task group will be starting up next week at the IEEE meeting uh, uh, and so forth. So um, just want to mention this will be in the slide deck. Uh, if you want to learn more, uh, I'd say take a look at the uh, IEEE standards, Wi Fi organization, uh, Wireshark, and uh, you know feel free to. Uh, contact me uh, online um, if you have, uh, on, you can find me on LinkedIn uh, if you have uh, other questions. Um, so that's uh, that's the slide deck. Um, I saw there were a few questions in the chat window. I can go to those or- oh, sure. Yes, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, oh. you see the questions? Go okay, ahead. sure. Yeah, I'm gonna scroll back here. So you guys, it's, I've been, I know I've been talking at a pretty quick late. I think someone asked about the tools I used here. So. Um, oh, and then it disappeared. You know, I, oh yeah, yeah. Someone asked what the MATLAB tool was. Let me, I'll just go back to that slide real quick and, and um, kind of talk about that. So yeah, this is the, so the MATLAB tool is the MATLAB Wireland toolbox. Um, this is uh, uh, this you know MathWorks sells this. It's a it's a toolbox uh, there. Um, there there's a there actually a lot the, the, the this toolbox um, works with um, a number of different uh, um, hardware tools for actually capturing packets. I think so. so I'd asked about the uh, USRP. So yeah, USRPs uh, is one uh, is one way. Uh, I I haven't actually used that. Uh, um, the the one um, and yeah I don't want to give like commercial plugs here uh, but I'll, I'll tell you probably what I actually use so there's there's a company called Aronia um, they're 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 based in Germany they they sell the Spectrum box the nice thing about this box is, is it can handle a very wide bandwidth um, so um, they sell one that that will do with two antennas at 245 megahertz so that's that's the capture tool. I uh, used here, and the and the these outputs here are all from a, the wireless LAN toolbox. So um, that's uh, that's that tool uh, and the digitizer. And then I got a new one. Um, okay, yeah. Someone asked about uh, about eight to eleven. Uh, yeah, Lauren asked about eight to eleven S and uh, DCF type communications that don't don't include an AP. That's a great question, and you know I don't have any good slides. 
on that. I, I'm, yeah, you know, I, I that's a that's a good topic, and I missed it. So there, there are a lot of mesh products on the market right now um, that um, uh, uh, you know they do, um, and and it's actually kind of interesting because they they actually um, they they don't actually all em, em, employ the same the same standards. So um, and but if you want to learn more about how they work. Uh, there is there is uh, 8211 of course did uh, did an amendment 8211 a uh, 8211s a number of years ago um, uh, that has a um, a bunch of hooks in it for doing mesh um, but the the mesh products themselves some of them use that some of them do proprietary things um, and but there are Wi-Fi alliance protocols and unfortunately um, you know I I haven't looked at these I. Uh, I'd have to, uh, and I don't remember the the particular Wi-Fi Alliance um, specification off the top of my head. But there, I um, there, there's one called Easy Mesh, and there's a there's a couple of others, um, and you may you may see uh, Wi-Fi products. But unfortunately, Wi-Fi pro some Wi-Fi products follow those 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 standards, but other Wi-Fi products do things that are proprietary, and um, uh, I don't know a good I think if I know a good place to find information about that, I, yeah. I, other than those, other than those two standards areas, I, I don't. So, um, but uh, so I guess I guess maybe that was a long answer to your question. Is there continuing development? Yes, there is. There hasn't been. Um, I'm not aware of anything new in the uh, eight to eleven standards body itself. Uh, but there is um, the Wi-Fi Alliance. Um, is develop it is still continuing to develop the easy mesh uh, uh, their easy mesh specification unfortunately the Wi-Fi alliance is not open the same way 80 to 11 is so you can't you can't read all their contributions um, but the they do publish the the standards or their the specifications rather that they develop they put them on their website and so you can you can download them there um, Uh, okay, so there, so DCF communications typically still involve an AP to authenticate stays that will then communicate directly with each other. Yes, that that's uh, that's true. Um, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of if if there's a um, yeah, there's there's always that problem um, that if you have two uh, two client devices that don't um, you know that aren't part of an AP that that yeah, there, there's a it's generally sort of a security uh, problem there. Now, the um, I think there's a couple kind of um, you know, issues related to that. Um, why the Wi-Fi Alliance has a, a standard called Wi-Fi Direct, which is which is used you know sort of for this kind of peer-to-peer Wi-Fi or uh, thing. But that that actually in 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 that case one one device actually takes on the role of an access point. So it's it uses the same sort of, um, you know, access point uh, stay uh, network uh, as uh, traditional eighty two eleven, but it it does it in one of the devices acts, uh, um, you know, one of the devices taking on that role as an AP. Um, hey Chris, do you see yeah. any other questions on your on your end? I don't see any new ones. No, so as I think I think I. Sort of covered it then. So okay, yeah. Let me ask a couple questions then. Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so, are there any products currently that's using the new six gigahertz band on the in the market? Yes, there, there are. In fact, um, there. Uh, you know, Wi-Fi has a labeling for this. They call this Wi-Fi six E. Is mm -hmm. is their uh their marketing that they have for that? I don't know. Um. You know, actually, that's a great question. I'm wondering if this, I, I would imagine this phone I have actually does Wi-Fi 6E. Um, if we jump back to this this slide here, I, I showed a packet capture off off Wireshark, and one of the 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 nice things about Wireshark is you can actually see, uh, you know, when a when a device, uh, when when like a device like a client device wants to access the network, it'll it'll oftentimes send a it it will start off by sending a probe request frame and in the probe request frame it'll it'll indicate 
you know, a bunch of its different capabilities here. Um, and and these are these have these tags here. I've I've outlined one here. It's you know, HE means it's Wi-Fi six or AI. Yeah. Um, a device may signal here um, in in one of these. It may be buried in a vendor specific uh, tag here that the Wi-Fi Alliance oftentimes uses this one that's you know, it's labeled Microsoft, but it's really used by the Wi-Fi Alliance. It might actually be in there signaling that. Um, but uh, yeah, so I guess you know the short answer is yes. There there are devices that have the capability to use um, six gigahertz. You, you'll see it as Wi-Fi six E on, on the market. Um, yeah. Okay. Oh, and um, I see someone someone mentioned that the can be both a mobile state and an AP. A personal hotspot. Yes, that's exactly what's going on. Where the personal hotspot feature is, uh, the the device, which is normally a client, will act as and can act as an access point uh, as well. And it it can do some time sharing or it can do some other things to um, uh, allow you to connect to it as an access point. There's another question that just came from Lauren. Okay. Sure. Okay. Uh, Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, so he's asking is the, uh, in the Wireshark, is the RSSI type data included in the packet uh, providing received signal strength? So th that's actually not, yeah, you see that there. That's that's actually, um, that that's not contained in the packet. That That's actually measured uh, by the Wi-Fi chip in the in the computer. In, in this case, this was a, a Linux box I had with an, with an Intel Chipset. I don't remember off the top of my head which which one it is, but the the um, the chipset in the uh, uh, in the the computer is actually uh, measures the the received signal strength level on the on the packets as it receives them, uh, and then passes that up uh, in in there's a there's something called a radio tap header. You can see that here. It says radio tap header. The radio tap header contains information. Uh, the, you know that that comes out of this the chipset itself and passes it up to Wireshark and that's where that comes from. So yeah, I, I use that feature. I, I, Wireshark is very nice because you can um, you can pull things out of the radio tap header or other fields and and put them you know line them up in the, the display here with the packet. And I, I usually use that as a as a sanity check to make sure I, I know what I'm looking at. So I have my my phone actually very close to the um, uh, to the to the packet sniffer PC here, and so the signal levels are high, and that way I know it's my phone, and and that, that's what I that's what I use that for. But um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's great. Uh, I guess uh, anybody else have questions? You can also unmute yourself and uh, ask, <clears throat> provide your question uh, verbally. You don't want to type it into the chat. We don't know how to do that. Any other questions from the audience? Okay. Maybe I can uh, okay. ask what else is in Wi-Fi 8 except uh, what you already mentioned. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is that's great. So, all right. So, I I, I mentioned things in Wi-Fi Wi-Fi 7 actually. So, why wi Wi-Fi 8 is starting next week. So, we I don't know what's going to be in Wi-Fi 8 yet, but well, Wi-Fi 7 um yeah, so look, I'm going to back up and and, and kind of you know there are uh, there's a lot. I, actually, you know, Wi-Fi seven is big, um, and there are I, I you know just sort of summarized uh, you know some of the um, you know some of the key big things here. Um, some things are are actually unknown. So a, a large part of of the specification eight uh, eleven be uh, is actually identifying. Um, features that you know perhaps had been defined in in earlier standards like like Wi-Fi six or so forth, um, but then makes them uh, you know say mandatory in a certain situation or manage. So so it, it takes it ta it takes some features. Um, I'm trying to f think of like some good ones off the top of my head, but um, one of the um, you know besides the, the you know these enhancements to say to the target wake time, um, I you know there. There are, I, I think it's there. There's a lot of text um, uh, related to uh, you know making um, 
uh, say like, uh, you know, use of LDPC codes or use of, um, use of, uh, uh, you know, OFDMA features, um, uh, you know, uh, what I would say is sort of tightening them up so, so people are more likely to use them. Uh, another, f but another feature actually now, um, right, it's probably easier to show with a picture. Um, in, in Wi-Fi 6, you know, we, we have OFDMA where, where the frequency band can be divided up. And these are, you know, each of these, um, you know, rectangles corresponds to a subband, you know, that, that is assigned to a different user. In, in Wi-Fi 6, the rules are very rigid. Like if you're going to use these, each one has to be assigned to a different client device. And, and so, um, but in Wi-Fi um, wi 7, um, it, it's, it's a little more complicated. You, you, can, you can take multiple what they call resource units. These are called resource units. You make multiple resource units and, and assign them to one client device. So it gives more flexibility uh, for um, OFDMA. That, that's one thing that's done in the physical layer. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the big thing, of course, are, you know, the speed increase and the, the larger constellation size. Um, but the, the, the multiple links, multiple links turns out to be actually quite complicated. And so there's a fair amount of text uh, in the standard devoted to that. But um, to be honest, a, a lot of things in, in for, you know, what's going to happen in Wi-Fi 7, I don't, I don't actually know which, which features are going to, um, you know, end up in products and, and how they'll be used. Um, a lot of that, um, you know, the, the 80 to 11 BE standard, of course, still isn't, isn't, isn't complete yet. They're, they're, uh, it's it's in the it's in the draft stage. It's it's pretty close, but it's going to go through a few more revisions. That's one thing that's going to happen. But then at the same time, the Wi-Fi Alliance uh, is still developing their test plan uh, for um, uh, for Wi-Fi Seven, and the test plan is is like you know what what features do they actually test in devices to make sure they interoperate, and and in, in a lot of ways the Wi-Fi Alliance then is is going to determine what you know what actually ends up in those products, and um, that's actually that that's not public, so those documents aren't aren't available publicly. Um, what 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 will happen is 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 um, once that once the once the products become available, once the the, the test plan uh, is in place and stuff, um, it'll be possible to you know kind of test the products and and see, and there'll be more information uh, available then. About, about Wi-Fi seven. Um, okay, okay, there's a there's a long question in here on mesh. Yeah, so. Oh, okay. Uh, more comment. Gonna, more <laughs> comment. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Fair enough. And, uh, Fair. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. I guess uh, you know we don't want to keep you too long, and also people uh, from uh, East Coast. It's probably getting late for them, but uh, yeah. Thank you for uh, this presentation and. Uh, I guess on the last slide, you have your contact information. Um, yep. I yeah, yeah. Good. I'll just yeah. put that up on the screen. Yeah, you know, if you have questions or interested in learning more about Wi-Fi, you know, feel free to contact me uh, and on LinkedIn. And and uh, yeah, it's good. Thank you very much for uh, uh, letting me talk tonight. Thanks. Uh, sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, thank you, okay. Chris. Mm -hmm. That was an excellent talk. Thanks very much. And uh, yeah, hopefully, uh, you know, we'll be able to if you come down here in person. Maybe yeah, I, I I will sometime. I okay. look forward to that too. Okay. Right. Right. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks. Okay, great. Great talk. Great. Yep. Okay, really good talk.